Okay, moving on to the afternoon session <coughs> of skirmishes and wars. Uh, I would like to introduce the chair for this particular one, Lieutenant Colonel Murray Duckworth, uh, to handle the session for us. Murray. Well, good afternoon, team. Um, first of all, I'd just like to say it's always challenging after lunch, isn't it, to, uh, to take in what's being presented. The second point I'd like to make is that following our technological advances this morning, Jason uh, used to have hair before this morning. <laughs> so uh, we'll keep up the good work, Jason. Um, look, it's, it's my great pleasure this afternoon to um, introduce Jeff, Jeff Hopkins West. We're moving from admirals and redcoats to skirmish and, skirmishes and wars. Um, so today, Jeff's going to give us a paper on Victorian and New Zealand wars of the 1860s and the Victorians in the Taranaki military settlers and the New Zealand Army Constabulary. By way of introduction, we have another well-published author. Surprise, surprise. Um, Jeff has written um, uh, many publications. He's a professional historian. He has an interest in Australia's involvement in the New Zealand wars. And he's currently an historian with the community engagement team with DVA in Canberra. So if anyone wants a, a bit of a tip on uh, DVA claims, there's a man. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, we, uh, we're very appreciative uh, of you coming down today and making this presentation. And no doubt you're well qualified to give us this address. Thanks, Mike. Thank you very much. Right, I've just guided on just one down. How, is there, how's that? Everyone can hear me well there? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, right. Let's, yeah. let's get into it. Once, look at that, it's working. That's what I like to see. <laughs> okay, the so-called Maori Wars during the 1840s and the 1860s saw considerable involvement from the Australian colonies, and no more so than that which emanated from Victoria. Now today's paper, though tempered by the limited time available, I'm, uh, I'm going to touch on some of the general various support and direct involvement uh, which Victoria provided. But my main focus is to provide you with some glimpses into these two New Zealand colonial units which received significant numbers of colonial Victorians within their ranks. And that's the Taranaki military settlers, both the Otago contingent and the Melbourne contingent components that were recruited during 1863 and 1864 but also the New Zealand Armed Constabulary, which recruited over 200 recruits in Melbourne in late 1868 and early 69. Now, the Australian colonies played uh, pivotal roles during the wars which unfolded in New Zealand, which continued to be forgotten or poorly understood, despite being an important part of... Um, I should also say, I should put Craig's book up there, just as apologies, Craig, that, that's, that'll be corrected next time I do this. Um, anyway, it, the, it's often forgotten, poorly understood, despite the important part of Australia's military, social, political and economic history that these wars played. And it's also similarly of importance as a, a component of the shared trans-Tasman experience. Now New Zealand's wars must be considered in the broader context of frontier conflict and the British Empire, but it's really a complex and detailed shared history. Now throughout 1845-46, Australia became a key contributor to New Zealand's uh, logistic and commissariat requirements. Australian stores and arsenal provided a considerable array of weapons and artillery, ammunitions and associated military equipment. Australian garrisons provided over 1,500 soldiers, the 58, 99, 96 and 65th regiments for New Zealand service between March 45 and November 1846. These troops were augmented with available Australian-based uh, Royal Navy ships and many sailors and marines who served ashore as part of the Naval Brigade. The Imperial garrisons in Australia therefore provided the bulk of the military force able to be put into the field during the 1840s campaigns. Military assistance from other parts of the Empire took considerable time to be marshaled and arrived late. In the meantime, New Zealand's repeated calls for assistance and the ready and willing responses of the Imperial and Colonial representatives in Australia met the needs of the immediate crisis. New Zealand Governor Gray's requests for assistance were always met in some form and his ability to repeatedly to procure and maintain a vast Imperial military force was to be replicated upon his return to the New Zealand stage in the 1860s. Now in 1860, war again broke out in New Zealand in and around the settlement of New Plymouth. New Zealand again turned to Australia for assistance. Now these colonies provided a wide range of support which was vital in stemming 
both the military and the potential military and social crisis that was faced at Taranaki. In the replication of the 1840s complex, complex sorry, Australia became a major source for New Zealand's immediate logistic and commissariat needs. Geographical proximity and the ease of supply enabled Australian commissariat stores and arsenals to supply camp equipment, rifles, revolvers, artillery, and an array of munitions and other military equipment. Such war material included stores and foodstuffs to fill the larders of the military forces being assembled in Taranaki, as well as the military horses in which to carry such supplies. Now, the departure of portions of the imperial garrison saw an impetus to existing volunteer movements. And with this came a realisation that a degree of self-reliance and a more long-term planning was essential beyond the short-term immediacy of the Taranaki crisis. Many members of the volunteer movement in the colonies, such as Victoria, also expressed desires to serve. Though at this date, this manpower potential was not tapped, but it's a clear indication of the support and martial fervour that the Australian military settler recruiting missions would elicit during 1863 and 1864, and does account for many of its recruits. Now, Australian humanitarianism saw money and material goods collected for the alleviation of the sufferings of the Taranaki settlers, and although not on the scale of the Taranaki Relief Fund, other Australian colonists contributed to the relief of families of British soldiers sent to fight across the Tasman, who were actually stuck here in the garrison um, towns. Now, Taranaki's war needs also saw many of the available vessels of the Australia Station serve in New Zealand waters, and hundreds of its personnel in turn served the shortest part of the naval brigade as did Majesty's colonial ship Victoria and elements of its crew. The Australian colonies, apart from dispatching Australasia's most senior military officer, Major General Pratt, from Victoria to take personal command in July 1860, also contributed a considerable supplement to the available forces in Taranaki. And between April and July 1860, over 900 additional officers and men of the Royal Artillery, 40th and 12th Regiments and Royal Engineers were conveyed from Sydney, Melbourne and Hobart for war service. Now, the high watermark of Australian military involvement across the Tasman, though, took place during 1863-64. The Australian colonies again supplied a considerable array of commissariat and logistic material, ensuring the magnitude of the imperial and colonial war machine that rolled through the Waikato, uh, Taranaki, and other locations of New Zealand's North Island. Australia's commissariat stores and arsenals again contributed rifles and carbines, munitions, artillery, and other associated ordnance material, while the trade in military horses also greatly increased. Armoured river gunboats were manufactured in Sydney to meet New Zealand orders, and existing riverboats uh, were purchased from South Australia. These colonies also contributed naval coal and other stores and services, as well as commercial shipping used for a variety of military and commissariat purposes. Australian pastoralists successfully tended for meat and cattle contracts from imperial forces in New Zealand, and other colonial enterprises and industries supplied many foodstuffs military clothing and other equipment for the war effort, including instruments for the band. Now, Imperial soldiers and sailors, along with the military settlers, represent Australia's manpower contribution to the forces being amassed in the North Island at this time. Now, although just over 680 Imperial troops were dispatched to assist during uh, August through to October 1863 from Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, Brisbane and Hobart, it should be remembered that most Australian garrisons had not yet had those troops that had been sent in 1860 returned, despite Governor Gray's assurances they would. <coughs> Similarly, those soldiers made available in 1863 again constituted a military force that was able to be put into the field promptly, whereas many of the Imperial re reinforcements coming from other Empire locations did not arrive till on late in 1863 or into 1864. Now, there's been in the past a bit of mis misconception that the military settler recruiting in Australia, uh, that these were mercenaries. They were certainly not. Others have argued that these colonial troops recruited by the New Zealand government did not constitute an Australian force. Yet, the recruitment of military settlers in Australia in 1863 especially was not only condoned by Australian colonial governments and imperial representatives, but was supported as part of a greater overall effort to assist their sister British colony, New Zealand. Of course, once in New Zealand, many of these volunteers served in military settler units with distinctive Australian identities, including the Victorian contingent and the New South Wales contingent within the uh, four uh, Waikato military settler regiments during 1863, followed by the Melbourne contingent, which was the largest component of the Taranaki military settlers in 1864. As such, these troops had a direct Australian identification, though of course cloaked as citizens of an empire, and of the estimated 2,500 men who 
enterprise in 1863 and 1864 military settler recruiting missions, many did not serve solely in the military settlers, as hundreds went on to join other colonial units. But apart from the formal uh, Australian military settler recruiting missions, which achieved this 2,500 men, and many with families, especially those who were enlisted in 1864, there is evidence of individuals or small groups departing Australian colonies on their own initiative. It's very hard to ascertain the actual numbers involved, though that could well have included hundreds of additional men uh, for, to cater for New Zealand's manpower needs. Now additionally, it must not be forgotten, colonial Australians also enlisted into the regiments of the British Army in garrison, such as the 40th and 12th in Victoria and New South Wales, as well as were recruited in ports such as Sydney for service aboard Royal Navy vessels, and they too would serve in these wars. Another misconception is that the volunteers raised for the four uh, Waikato military settler regiments were all recruited in the Australian colonies. Colonial Australians actually only make up very proportions of the individual strengths of each of those regiments, uh, as they did with the separately raised Taranaki military settlers. Now, although exacting figures for Australian enlistments are difficult to determine, it's clear that the large proportion of Australian enlistees are not to be found in the 1st Waikato Regiment, as often believed, but rather the late formed 4th Waikato Regiment, but also the Taranaki um, military settlers. And of course, despite listings of Australia's war involvements, which include the 1885 Sudan contingent or the many colonial contingents to the war in South Africa for our federation in 1901, we nonetheless continue to ignore or downplay the New Zealand wars or cite no Australian casualties. Now, my research has previously identified at least 53 Australian-derived Waikato or Taranaki military settlers were killed in action, died of wounds, or died during the service, uh, during the service through 1863 to 1869. Um, with some of these fatalities occurring while on service with other New Zealand colonial units after leaving the military settlers. And what will interest today's audience, especially is that 41 of these men had Victorian origins, which can be included uh, for further individuals who were not military settlers who stayed in New Zealand, but who enrolled in the Armed Constabulary in Melbourne in December 1868, who were shortly after killed in action or died of wounds during 1869. But it is the Taranaki military settlers where some of the most significant numbers of Australian-derived and predominantly Victorian enlisted personnel are to be found. The Taranaki military settlers experienced a wide range of field service, engagements and casualties through 1864-66 on the west coast of New Zealand's North Island, but also on the east coast during 1865-66, and it's among the Victorian-derived personnel where the majority of the unit's casualties occur. If looking just at the late wars period of 1868-69, I've also previously identified at least 14 Australian enlisted or derived armed constabulary fatalities. Most of these had their origins in New Zealand, firstly, as enlistees in either the Waikato or Taranaki military settler regiments, and who stayed on in New Zealand and joined the armed constabulary there, following the disbandment of the uh, military settler units in 1867. <coughs> Six of these men are former Victorian military settlers who had enlisted in either 1863 or 1864, to which we then include those four others who enrolled in Melbourne during December 1868, one of whom, Constable Robert Davis, Although a former military settler in the 3rd Waikato Regiment, who enrolled in Melbourne in September 1863, had returned to Victoria at some stage, um, and in Melbourne in December 1868, decided to again enrol for New Zealand service and would die of wounds five months later. I got that right, sorry, I thought I was going to muck that up. Okay, now a review of the uh, nominal and descriptive role of the Melbourne contingent of the Taranaki military settlers shows that at least 557 men of enlisted rank were enrolled in Victoria, along with a small number from South Australia who were transshipped to Melbourne during January 1864. One member of the Melbourne contingent was Francis Sy, who enrolled in Geelong in January 64, departed Melbourne aboard the Gresham, and arrived in New Plymouth and Taranaki in February 64 and served in number 8 company. His 1877 confirmation of entitlement for the New Zealand War Medal documented that he'd been under fire on the west coast in actions at Century Hill in April 64, the siege of Pipariki in July 65, and was also a member of the East Coast Expeditionary Force, which included number eight and ten companies of the Taranaki military settlers, which saw action at Depodiki in November 65. Now, upon return from the east coast, the time of service of these uh, Taranaki military settlers had expired, and there was a disagreement over pay and entitlements, and caused many of them to claim their discharge in a bit of a defiant stance, which led them to lose all their land entitlements. Sire was one of these men, so like many other disgruntled former 
military settlers. He moved on in search of other colonial opportunities, and he's returned back across the Tasman and was resident in Victoria in 1872 when he applied for his New Zealand War Medal. And like many other Australian-derived military settlers, service in the volunteer movement before or after their New Zealand service was also common. He appears to have been involved in the Victorian Volunteers, as indicated on the receipt for his war medal, which was witnessed by Brun at Brunswick by Lieutenant and Brigade Captain James Frisbee Wilkinson of the Northern Volunteer Rifles. Wilkinson himself is a Taranaki military settler veteran. veteran. Born in uh, Launceston and Tassie, he enlisted in Melbourne in January 64. He also departed uh, for the aggression for Taranaki, so may well have known Francis Sire at that point. Uh, he served in number 10 company at the siege of Piperiki and then in the East, uh, as part of the East Coast Expeditionary Force. And as you can see, there's a portrait of Wilkinson as a lieutenant uh, there, wearing his proudly his New Zealand War Medal, along with it, there's a collection of letters he wrote from the siege of Piperiki that's in the Australian War Memorial Collection. Now, the arrival of the New Zealand Government Party in Sydney, headed by the Native Minister Francis Dillon Bell, the Civil, Civil Commissioner for the Waikato, John Eldon Gorst, and New Zealand Militia Officers Colonel George Dean Pitt, who has a, a prior Victorian connection, as many of you may be aware, and Captain J.H. Rogers Harrison, arrived in Sydney on the 14th of August 63. This marks the beginning of military settler recruiting in, in uh, the Australian colonies. The Argus the next day announced the expected arrival of Colonel Pitt to raise a regiment of volunteers for New Zealand. That same day, an advertisement sought volunteers for the Auckland militia, and that marks the beginning of the recruiting here in Victoria. Pitt arrived on the 21st of August and immediately sought an interview with the Victorian government to prevent, he, uh, present his credentials and to seek support for, uh, from Victoria's authorities. And the press quickly responded in support of New Zealand, reinforcing the threat of blood, uh, the blood and kinship that connected all the colonies of Australasia. As would occur in other Australian colonies, it's from among the ranks of Victoria's volunteer movement where many of the volunteers for New Zealand would emanate. But despite the positive initial response with enrolments, Pitt, after he arrived, he felt obliged to state that he did not desire, and I quote, uh, that the recruits should be formed of trained volunteers alone and all are invited to join. Basically, they wanted uh, far people with farming experience more so than soldiers in, because the New Zealand government had this grand military settlement scheme. The first uh, Victorian contingent comprised just over 400 privates and NCOs, and they were placed under the command of four officer appointees. These included Captain Henry Goldsmith, former captain in the Victorian Volunteer Engineers, Lieutenants William Alfred Smith, a former Lieutenant Senior Jewel Instructor for the Pentry Volunteer Rifle Company, Hugo Byam Lomax, and William Nunnington, a former Jewel Instructor with the Fitzroy Volunteer Rifle Company. This first uh, Victorian contingent boarded uh, on the 31st of August, and the Argus noted that the contingent of volunteers from Melbourne left uh, first by train uh, in the morning, followed by uh, volunteers who enlisted at Geelong, Ballarat, Castle, Maine, and Sandhurst a couple of late, uh, hours later. The Star of India sailed for Auckland the next day, and as recruiting in Melbourne and regional centres was still going on briskly, Colonel Pitt chartered the, the Caduceus to convey a second contingent. And the second contingent of vol volunteers boarded the Caduceus uh, several days later, uh, after the morning train brought 80 men from Sandhurst, 32 from Castlemaine, and others were, arrived in Melbourne in the afternoon. So Pitt enrolled another 150 at Sandhurst and 45 at Castlemaine. And a further 25 came forward in Melbourne the same day, and more were expected to follow from Pitt's vi uh, planned visit to Dijon and Ballarat uh, the following day. <clears throat> now two former Imperial Army officers who had settled in Victoria were selected to command the second contingent. These were lieutenants John Joseph Dunn and John Spencer Percival, and they were shortly after joined by a Ballarat and an officer appointee, Lieutenant Robert Wallace. Lieutenant Percival and three other Victorian enlistees serving in the 1st Waikato Militia within a month of their arrival would be killed in action on the 23rd of October 1863, the first fatalities amongst the Australian enlisted military settlers. Now, over 930 enlisted rank volunteers would depart Melbourne in three contingents for Auckland in 1863. The Star of India had four officers and 406 men, the Caduceus, three officers and 386 men, and the Golden Age had four officers and 140 men, and three other officers uh, made their own way to New Zealand. Now, of all these volunteers, 35% were said to be drilled men, that's either former Victorian volunteers or uh, former Imperial soldiers or sailors. 9% at this point were married men, the average age was 27, and then actually we have stats that the average height was 5 foot 7 and a half inches. 
That's the only detailed um, description we have of any of the volunteers so for that. Anyway, <coughs> during early 1864, Colonel Pitt undercut, came back and undertook a second military settler recruiting mission here in Victoria, and he secured nearly 800 further volunteers, along with a small number from the neighbouring colony of South Australia. Now, this total number, including families at this point now, amounted to nearly 2,000 souls who departed Melbourne through January and February 64. Now, that's a considerable achievement, despite, at this point, there was growing opposition and criticisms within Victoria uh, to what was going on. Now, Australian-derived military settlers carried out varying roles in the campaigns in New Zealand during 1863 to 1867. The first recorded engagement involving a detachment of the 1st Waikato, often known as Pitt's Militia, took place on the 14th of September 1863 near Drury on the Great South Road in Auckland Province. It's unclear whether any of those had Australian origins, but some sources claim there are. Now, the first Australian-derived Waikato militiamen killed in action occurred at Wheeler's Farm on Titi Hill near Morku Stockade on the 23rd of October 1963. The Australian-derived men who were killed were all Victorian enlistees from Bendigo, Lieutenants John Spencer Spencer Percival, Corporal Michael Bauer, and Privates William Beswick and William Williamson. And one of the last field campaigns involving elements of the Waikato military settlers was the first Waikato reg uh, regiment's involvement in the Toranga Bush campaign through January and March 1867, including amongst the campaign's casualties at that point were three Victorian enlisted privates who were killed. William Stevenson and Dennis Augustus Ward on the, in January 67, and the following month, Henry Jeffs. Now, the first active service of the Australian enlisted component of the Taranaki military settlers occurred on the 11th of March, 1864. The 57th Regiment, supported by elements of the Melbourne Volunteers, who were also known as the Melbourne Contingent within the Taranaki military settlers, carried out a successful reconnaissance of Maori positions at Kaitaki in Taranaki province. On this occasion, those Melbourne uh, Volunteers involved were largely held in reserve and uh, with no casualties. But the Melbourne Volunteers were shortly again in action in, uh, on the 25th of March, taking part in an attack and in the capture of the Kaitaki Pa. Here, one company of Melbourne and Otago Volunteers, under Captain Corbett, were engaged for the first time and distinguished themselves by the spirited manner in which they assaulted and then took one of the stockades, which was considered to be one of the key to the enemy's positions. Captains James McKellar and Andrew Page's two companies of Taranaki military settlers also took part in this attack, and it's believed this probably uh, Melbourne and Otago, and I include the, the Otago because many Victorians were in the South Island for the gold and then join up in Otago in the South Island. So many Victorians are amongst that, that contingent. Anyway, there's about 240 officers and men who were involved. At this point, there's no fatalities amongst the Melbourne volunteers, but this was the change suddenly on the 6th of April 64. In an ambush of elements of the 57th Regiment and a detachment of the Taranaki military settlers near Kaitaki resulted in seven killed and 12 wounded. Four enlisted uh, personnel, Corporal, Corporal John Banks, Privates John Gallagher, Charles Hartley and James Nagel, were among the troops who were killed, decapitated and otherwise mutilated, and four other Victorians were wounded. One of the last active field operations involving the Taranaki military settlers took place in an attack on the Māori village of Pakaikai and Patea district on the 2nd of August 1866. This involved the Taranaki military settlers from numbers 8 and 10 company, the Patea and Wanganui Rangers and the Wanganui Cavalry. And during this attack, Private Dennis Spain, a Melbourne enlisted private, was accidentally killed. And the last Australian-derived Taranaki military settlers to be killed were Lieutenant Bamba Gascoigne and his whole family, along with Privates John Milne and Edward Richards, in the White's Cliffs Massacre in Taranaki District on the 13th of February 1869. These men had all enlisted in Victoria and had the dubious distinction of being the only Australian-derived military settlers who were killed on their military land settlements. And it must be remembered that many military settlers also served in a variety of other colonial units during the period 1863-67, such as the Colonial Defence Force of Cavalry, the Partea Rangers, the Partea Rifle Volunteers, and especially the Arkansas Cavalry from 8 October 1867 when this force was established. Now in 1868-69, when New Zealand authorities faced a parrot crisis on the West Coast and East Coast, they again sought assistance from Australia. With the events, the military reverses and the so-called massacres elicited much comment in the Australian press. But despite genuine concerns about the events that were unfolding across the Tasman, the Australian colonists would not provide 
aid in the form or quantity as they had in 1860 or 1863. Nonetheless, there's important Australian involvement through this period. Many former Australian enlisted military settlers continued to serve in New Zealand's armed constabulary and other volunteer or militia forces, and it is from the ranks of the armed constabulary, and especially the Melbourne recruitment of personnel, the last specifically targeted Australian recruits, which continued to prove Australia's important contributions to New Zealand's military manpower needs. Now, on the west coast of the North Island, New Zealand government forces suffered a series of dramatic military reverses against the Māori leader Titukauru and his forces in South Taranaki and the Wanganui regions. And these occurred in engagements at Tūratua Maikai, Tenutu Otomanu, and Motoroa through uh, July into November of 68. On the east coast, another Māori leader, Takuti, and his followers created similar difficulties for government forces following his escape from imprisonment on the Chatham Islands and initially with several actions in July 1868 in the Poverty Bay in the Hawke's Bay uh, area. The impact of Takuti was dramatically reinforced in what became known as the Poverty Bay Massacre on the 10th of November 1868. Now the news of this growing military crisis was no doubt a stimulus for some of the men who would soon come forward in Melbourne to offer their services and especially those who already had prior New Zealand military service or even, as many did, family and friends in New Zealand. Into this scenario appeared New Zealand militia officer Captain William Griffin Stack, who arrived in Melbourne to enlist in the Armed Constabulary. And despite his recruiting efforts rekindling some of the criticisms earlier levelled towards Colonel Pitt's military settler recruiting endeavours, especially during 1864, Stack's efforts uh, were nonetheless an overall success. Captain Stack arrived in Melbourne on the 28th of November 1868, tasked by his uh, New Zealand government to enlist 200 recruits for the armed constabulary. He'd actually been appointed a captain in the Auckland militia back in June 63, and had then been placed in command of a company of military settlers of the 1st Waikato Regiment. And he saw uh, action with that company in the Tauranga Bush Campaign in 1867. He then became paymaster for the colonial defence services in, at Tauranga and Apodiki in the Bay of Plenty area. And that's where he continued to um, have a lot more connection with the military settlers on their land. Uh, entitlements and of, of whom many were Victorians. So he seems to be quite an ideal candidate to have been selected for this um, uh, recruitment uh, process. Now to assist him, uh, um, a Dr Dermot was also dispatched from Hokitika from New Zealand South Island to provide uh, proper medical inspections of uh, pros prospective recruits and he arrived early in December. But Stack was also uh, assisted by Joseph Tuckwell, a former Victorian police detective from the late 1850s who left Victoria for Otago in November 61 to organise a detective force for that South Island district. And Tuckwell really is an example of, of one of the, men, of the many Victorian police officers who assisted the development of the provincial police forces in New Zealand, especially through the 1860s. Now the social turbulence which occurred in the wake of the opening of the gold fields there quickly led to several paramilitarised police forces being created, especially in the South Island. Um, which were not only modelled on Victoria's police, but used the services of many trained and experienced uh, members of the Victorian police force. Now, some of these Victorian police forces uh, officers continue to play significant roles in New Zealand's armed constabulary through the 1860s and into the 1870s, and that's a story in itself uh, that's quite separate to this. Anyway, Tuckle's a uh, private investigator. He's there to select the, uh, the, right, the right men, the right type of men, and this was necessary because the Victorian government had denied Stack any formal recognition or assistance from its own detective force at this time to weed out any criminal elements who might have tried to get across to New Zealand. Now the Argus uh, Saturday issue on the 5th of December 1868 drew its readership's attention to the full terms, conditions of the armed constabulary, and they will be published in the supplement, uh, the Argus supplement later to that day. Now recruiting would commence at uh, Meagher's Hotel in the corner of Lonsdale and Swanston Street, and those enlisted would embark on the following Wednesday for New Zealand. <laughs> Stack began to immediately receive applications that same day, and despite the Argus initially reporting that this recruiting mission was probably going to be a fruitless one, it then had to note that 100 men had already presented themselves for enrolment. Those who received their medical certification were formally enrolled the following Monday, and applications continued to be received. The first contingent aboard the Al Alhambra left for Wellington on the 9th of December and it comprised 99 recruits. A second contingent of 41 re recruits departed aboard the steamship Otago on the 12th of November, followed by a third contingent several, seven days later uh, with 30 recruits bom aboard the Rangatoto. Almost there. 
Among the men who made up the five contingents of the Melbourne recruits were many individuals who had prior service in the British Army or Royal Navy, or had already served in various police forces, including the Irish Catapulary, British or Australian volunteer militia units, and those who had already served in New Zealand's colonial forces earlier in the 1860s. One of the men aboard the Rangitoto was William Guthrie, a former Otago contingent Taranaki military settler with Victorian family connection. He had also served in the Partea Rangers during 1865-66 and had been severely wounded in action in September 1866 and he's returned to Victoria where he has again come forward for service and enrolled in the Armed Constabulary in Melbourne in December 68. In New Zealand he served in number one division Armed Constabulary and saw action at Otatu in, on the 30th of March 1869. Here he was part of a detachment of six volunteers who assisted Sergeant Richard Shepherd, who was tasked with holding a narrow path close to Titakaru's camp. And it was in this action that Sergeant Shepherd's bravery was later recognised by the award of the New Zealand Cross in 1876. But of the six volunteers involved in action that day, three were killed and three others, including Sergeant Shepherd, were all variously wounded. And I quote, Corporal Guthrie was struck in the mouth by a spent bullet, knocking out two of his teeth, and he coolly put his fingers into his mouth and pulled out the bullet. <laughs> Guthrie had already taken part in actions at Nukumaru and Karaka Flats during February 69, and he continued to have a role in the Army of the to the 1870s. Now, the continuing, con continual triple of applicants led to a fourth contingent of 90 recruits departing for, on the Gothenburg uh, late December, and a fifth and final contingent of 16 recruits left on the Omeo on the 5th of January 69. Captain Saki stays temporarily in uh, Melbourne because he's seeking uh, to procure ammunition uh, for the New Zealand government, uh, but he does depart for Sydney aboard the Hero on the 9th of January. His departure actually coincided with that of, the, of an Imperial Military Party of Major General Sir Trevor Shute, the Commander-in-Chief of Her Majesty's Forces in Australia and New Zealand, and Colonel Hyde Page. Although Shute's visit was mere, reported as merely a routine inspection of the British regular troops stationed in New Zealand, it would seem more than a mere coincidence that Captain Stack <coughs> Excuse me. Captain Stack was aboard and returning to New Zealand with this party at this time. As the official New Zealand government agent recruiting for the Army Constabulary, also seeking arms and ammunition, he no doubt had a lot to say to, uh, to the general en route to, to New Zealand. Now at this time, apart from the considerable Victorian public awareness of the military crisis in New Zealand, um, the Victorian government even proposed to send uh, the, the current garrison of 400 men of the 14th Regiment to New Zealand if it was deemed necessary. And that really just concludes. That's just trying to give you just a touch on a very complex and detailed uh, trans-Tasman uh, shared history. Um, and I hope you get a little bit of an understanding that Victoria was a major player in the wars that occurred across there. Um, yeah, so that's it. I would like to thank to Andrew and Victorian uh, Military History and Heritage for inviting me and help fund me to get here. So yeah, look, it was a pleasure to be here and, and give Give, give you a bit of word. And also thanks to Craig for profusely thanking me for, I did some stuff once. <laughs> <laughs> um, we do have time for, let's say two questions, two quick questions of Jeff. Yes. Thank you. Um, just, Jeff, a little bit of background on how that uh, military settler scheme worked. How long did they have to serve for and what did they sort of It's usually three years, depending on your rank, was, uh, there are, that, there's not just one set of um, military settler conditions, there's three different ones. They initially had one that's for the Waikato, um, because you've got, you're serving in different areas, and they eventually realised the government, New, Zealand, New Zealand government modified for a general service in, New, in the North Island service. So there's a set time frame, and depending on your rank, say you're a private, you get 50 acres. Uh, it was very lucrative for officers, you know, you could be getting several hundred acres. But by and large, the military settlement scheme in New Zealand failed miserably. Very few military settlers uh, were able to make a go of it. Part of it is, when you actually look at, particularly in 1863, most of the recruits do not have any farming experience. They, they're, they're particularly, say, some of, some of the recruits, particularly in, uh, in the South Island, gold is petered out, it's an opportunity, they enlist, Service is over, and you know they just they just move on, um, and that's why you get quite a mix or a return of these military settlers to places like Victoria. Or if they're following the gold, one thing you find that they go from Victor from the Victorian gold fields to Otago, 
do a bit of military service, might try the thing, and then they'll end up in Gympie in Queensland. So you'll find these veterans all over Australia. Um, but if you look at my book, I have quite a detailed um, breakdown of what all the, the conditions were. There's an appendix that covers all that in quite a lot of detail. Thanks. Yes? So, so, do, you, do you have any idea how many uh, Australians went overall and how many were from Victoria? <sighs> There is no, there's no, even if you look at the, um, the, the, the regimental list and stuff like that, there's names crossed out, there's substitutes. I always say this, in the formal recruiting missions, it is upwards of 2,500 uh, men are enlisted. If you take those who are, are going over on their, on their own, even in Brisbane I found small groups organising going over. Now they're going to be enlisting in places like, um, you know, New Plymouth or uh, Auckland, and so they won't be recognised as where they've actually come from. But I would say, you know, upwards of 3,000 um, potential Australian-derived military settlers alone. Um, you could, you, there's probably several hundred um, colonial Australians have enlisted into the 40th and 12th regiments. Through particularly, there's a lot of desertions. The gold rush is an impetus for a lot of people to, to nick off. Um, but even in places like Brisbane. Uh, Getting good labourers, there's more money in being a labourer, so in Brisbane a lot of the soldiers um, disappear and they, they, they've got a very lucrative uh, role as a labourer, they have to get paid really well. Actually some of them actually take the uniform off during the day and come back to the barracks, so they've worked on building sites in Brisbane, but that's a different, whole different story. But yeah, look, upwards of 3,000, just military settlers alone. Okay, um, Jeff, thank you very much for your presentation today. Um, and I know General Barry picked up on this. Recruiting at a hotel. Yes. Like it. <laughs> um, and I noticed from uh, the photo that you had of Private Francis Sear. Ah, uh, that was uh, Lieutenant uh, Wilkinson. That, uh, oh, Wilkinson. Yeah, that was. The, the beard. Did anyone notice the beard? Um, and it's interesting now that Navy obviously have had beards for some time, but Air Force have now introduced beards into Air Force these days. Mm. So are we going around the circle? Mm. Um, and also your recruitment figure of five foot seven and a half. That, yeah, the, yeah. They, there was some. Uh, there's one press account for the for the Victor that all the Victorians in the ANC. Someone calculated. It's the only place where you get this really amazing breakdown and, and it's just that percentage is the, the press I think I've cited my book but the, they're quite detailed with the breakdown yeah. and it's one of the few there's quite a difference 1863 and 1864 there's um, 1864 they're farm they're, they're, when they're recruiting they really are looking for people with families and farming experience so when you get the late form fourth Waikato they are most of those personnel see very little action at all and they really just move straight on as farm. They want them in, in those areas that have been confiscated, the land confiscated, and get them on farms. So, yeah. No worries, Jeff. Um, oh. As a small token of our appreciation, I'd like to present you with some more boys. <laughs> um, I'd like to have a quick.